Hello, and here's a little video that I'm making. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about current voltage and resistance and the relationship between the three, that relationship we call um, Ohm's Law. So without further ado, let's get cracking. So voltage, as you guys know, is um, the energy source in an electric circuit. So typically... Um, we, in, in, for simplicity's sake, we'll use things like batteries um, to, to describe uh, a voltage source. But voltage sources are anything that have a separation of charge. So it could be a battery. It could also be a wall outlet. It could be an electric generator. Um, it could even be something like uh, a lemon uh, with a, a penny and a nickel stuck into it. Anything that's going to create a difference in uh, negative charges and positive charges. So the amount of energy that every charge has um, is called voltage. So voltage is a measure. Let's pick an easier color to see here. Voltage is the amount of energy that every unit of charge carries. So if you imagine every electron as it moves through the circuit has a certain amount of energy associated with it, right? It's carrying some electrical potential energy with it. And that's what we call voltage, the amount of energy that every charge carries. So it's symbolized with a capital V and it has units of volts. And those volts are named as such because um, they're named after famous scientist Alessandro Volta who um, invented the battery, uh, the electrochemical cell. And he took basically acid and um, little bits of copper and stacked them on top of each other. And it was super, super dangerous, but it also generated uh, electrical current. So voltage is related to energy, but voltage is not exactly energy. So this is what I was just talking about on the other slide. Um, voltage is how much energy every unit of charge carries. Uh, so volts are basically energy, joules, per charge, charges measured in coulombs. So um, two things matter for electrical energy then, the amount of voltage and the amount of charge. If we were to break this down, electrical potential energy would be equal to voltage, which is joules per coulomb, times charge coulombs and that if you multiplied that through charge would cancel and you'd be left with joules which is energy so the energy of a battery depends on two things its voltage and the amount of charge so um, for example if you look at a standard double a battery the most common form of battery that we use those batteries have a voltage of one and a half volts Interestingly enough, AAA batteries, C batteries, and D batteries, all of those different sizes of batteries, they all have the exact same voltage. They're all one and a half volts. So then what's the difference between a AAA battery and a AA battery and a C battery and a D battery if they all have the same voltage? The difference is the amount of charges that they hold. So a AA battery has one and a half volts of voltage, but it holds a mere 9,000 coulombs of charge. So if you multiply those two numbers together, you get the total amount of energy stored in a AA battery, 13,500 joules. A D battery, the big fat ones, they have the same voltage as a AA battery, but they store twice the amount of charge. So instead of 9,000 coulombs of charge, they can actually store 18,000 coulombs of charge. So their energy, their electrical potential energy would be one and a half volts, that's joules per charge, times 18,000 charges, which would give an energy of about 27,000 joules. So these two different batteries, they provide the same energy per charge, but a D battery just has a lot more charges to carry energy with. Um, so you could use a AA battery 
in a device that calls for a D battery. It would still work. It would just run out. The battery would die about twice as fast as a D battery would. So generally we use AA batteries in devices that don't have to run for a particularly long time. And we use D batteries in devices that will need to run for longer periods of time because they simply have more charge. At home, voltage is really significant. So um, most of our batteries that we use are anywhere from one and a half up to three volts um, with like the, the biggest home batteries that you would find typically being nine volt batteries. Those are the rectangular ones. Um, your car actually uses a 12 volt battery, um, but the outlets in your house are a whole 110 to 120 volts of voltage. So 120 joules for every coulomb of charge that they put out. So when you plug something in, that amount of voltage applies to the circuit. And so electricity will flow through that circuit, which brings us to current. So current is the flow of charge within a conductor. It's the rate of flow is another way to think about this, the rate of flow of charge. And there is a big spider on me. Okay, so it's the rate of flow of charge. And uh, that charge only flows if there's some reason for it to flow. So that's what we call the potential difference. So you need some sort of voltage source, some sort of energy input in order for that charge to start moving. Um, current is symbolized with a capital I. And um, what that uh, symbol means is amperes. So that um, I is an ampere, and an ampere is named after André Ampere, or as it would be said in the French, André Ampère, who was a French physicist, and he helped um, define and describe electromagnetism. So the Ampere is named after him. So current is the rate of the flow of charge. So it's a ratio of time, just like velocity is position over time and acceleration, which is also a rate, is change in velocity over time. Current is sort of like the change in charge flow per time. So it's measured in the units of charge, coulombs, divided by the units of time, seconds. So one ampere, we usually call that an amp for short. One amp is equal to one coulomb per second. So, and for example, if we were to calculate the current in this particular problem, in 30 seconds, so I'm given time is 30 seconds, 120 coulombs, so charge Q equals 120 coulombs, pass through the circuit. What is the current? So current is charge per time. So we do our 120 coulombs of charge divided by 30 seconds of time, and that would give me a current of four, and the units would be amperes. So four amperes or four amps of electrical current. So current um, typically is really, really small. So um, in our devices, et cetera, we generally like to have currents be relatively low because um, that, that means that there's less danger associated with it, right? So a current of 0 0.001 amps or amperes, that's something that you can feel. If that gets up to 0 0.005 amps, that would be painful. Like you would actually feel it as pain. Higher than that, at 0 0.01 amps, your muscles would stop, um, would lose control. And so you'd basically be um, involuntarily clenching your muscles. Think of like a... Uh, uh, when, when you get a little shock and your muscle clenches temporarily. At 0.015, you have total loss of muscle control. So your muscles completely seize up. Think about um, you know somebody that's getting hit with a taser, right? And they just totally lose control of their body. Excuse me, and clench up. 
And then at point oh seven, you could have serious injury. Um, so like internal burning, um, and then even potential uh, fatal response. Whew, bless me. If it lasts for a while. So current's kind of strange. Um, the reason current is strange is that um, it was discovered and described before electrons were discovered and described. So we knew about the flow of charge before we actually knew what was flowing. And so when this happened, um, we knew about protons, but not about electrons. And so the obvious assumption was, ah, charge is moving. That charge must be positive. And we know now that that's totally wrong. Positive charges generally stay in place because they're contained in the nucleus of atoms. Negative charges or electrons are what actually move through circuits. But because we discovered protons first, current was originally described as positive charges moving. So we call this conventional current. Conventional current. is the direction that positive charges would flow in a circuit. So it's the opposite of what actual current in real life is. Um, so in real life, I would know that in this circuit down here, electrons are flowing from left to right. but we would describe the conventional current, the physics current, as being protons moving from right to left. Yes, that's weird. Yes, that's backwards. It's super annoying. And that's exactly how it works in physics classes. I don't know why I don't run the show. Um, that's like a global tradition that persists to annoy students and teachers. <laughs> so moving forward from that, the last component of electrical circuits that we have to consider is electrical resistance. And so resistance does exactly what you'd think it'd do. It holds back the flow of charge. It prevents it from flowing more easily. Um, it, it is a resistor. It resists. And so that is symbolized with a capital R, and the units for that are ohms, of course named after George Ohm, who was a German physicist and determined the relationship between voltage, current, and resistance. So he gets the honor of having the um, units of resistance named after him. Um, resistance is just a ratio. It's how much current flows uh, for any given voltage through a circuit. And then in this picture here, these are actual resistors from modern electrical circuits. Um, as you saw in your reading and such, these are actually made of ceramic and they have these little lines drawn on them. And those little lines have different colors that um, visually signify how much resistance each one provides. So you'd find those in all kinds of circuits. They're really important electrical components. Okay, so what's the point of all this? How do these all relate to each other? Well, remember that voltage is sort of like the push or the source of a circuit, right? And current is the flow of the circuit. So how would you reasonably think those two would relate? Well, I would imagine that if I had more push, that that would lead to more flow, right? More source, more flow. You can kind of think of it like a water faucet, right? If I open the faucet more, provide more pressure for water, I would expect more water to flow. That's a, a very apt analogy for electrical circuits. So if voltage or the push increases, then current or the flow also increases and vice versa. If the voltage decreases, the current decreases as well. This is what we call a directly proportional relationship. So voltage is directly proportional to the current. But what about resistance, right? Well, resistance seems to do the opposite, right? If I have more resistance, resistance, then I would reasonably assume that I would also have less flow, right? More resistance means less flow. Um, and so in that case, 
increasing resistance would lead to current decreasing and vice versa. And this is an inverse relationship. So we could say current is inversely proportional to resistance. And this is what we call Ohm's law. So this graphic is super weird. It's also a favorite amongst phys physics teachers. Um, and what it shows is voltage, right? This little uh, pink guy, voltage trying to push charge through the circuit, right? So that's the amps. Volts, here, let me make them blue. Volts are trying to push the charge through. The charge itself is what's moving through the circuit. But as you can see, resistance makes it more difficult for that charge to move through. So you can think of voltage as sort of like pushing stuff through, but resistance is sort of like clenching the pipes shut. So it makes it harder for that current to move. And poor little current is stuck between this tug of war between voltage and resistance. That's what we call Ohm's law. So remember that for a circuit to be functional and safe, it needs three things. It needs a voltage source, like a battery um, or a power outlet. It needs a conducting loop, so wires, to allow charge to flow. It also needs some sort of load. It needs some place for energy to go. That's what we call resistance. So that could be a light bulb, it could be a toaster, it could be a resistor that just turns that energy into heat. And all of these three things relate in Ohm's law. So here's some actual data. Had we been in class, we would have done this lab. And um, what happens, as you can see, is if I build four circuits, one, two, three, four, the more batteries I put in my circuit. So here we have two AA batteries. Here we have four AA batteries and six AA batteries and eight AA batteries. And the more battery I put in, the more current I get out. You can actually see that when I double the battery, I double the current. When I triple the battery, I triple the current. And when I quadruple the battery, I approximately quadruple the current. So this is actually data from a student's lab from uh, last semester. So this shows again, voltage being directly proportional to current. It looks like this, a straight line if you graph these things. What that tells me is that voltage and current should be on opposite sides of an equal sign in a relationship. So if one gets bigger, the other gets bigger. Let's look at resistance. So in this case, we took one resistor, two resistors, three resistors, and four resistors and put them in the circuit with constant battery packs. So if I have one resistor, I had a current of about 0.26. If I have two resistors, that current goes down, and it goes down to 0.14. So this is doubling my resistance. I end up having my current. Is it exact? No. Is it approximately half? Yes. If I triple my resistance, so this is a tripling, then I end up thirding my voltage, third, right? 26 divided by three would be almost uh, 0.09. Um, so again, we're seeing that this is um, causing an increase in resistance cause the current to go down by the reciprocal of the resistance. So R is proportional to one over current or current is proportional to one over resistance. If I graph that, it looks like this. So it's an inverse relationship, a sort of one over X type of relationship. And so what that means is that voltage and current are actually on the same side of the equal sign. That would be R is proportional to one over I, or R times I is proportional to one, same side of the equal sign. So if you put these together, Here's my equal sign. I know that voltage and current needs to be on opposite sides of that equal sign. I also know that current and resistance need to be on the same side of that equal sign. And so this would be the only equation that has all of that true. And that is what's called Ohm's law. 
So V equals IR, or voltage is the product of current and resistance. If I divide both sides of this by R, I would get I equals V over R. And what that shows is this sort of push and pull between voltage and resistance, right? Current is the flow. Voltage makes that flow bigger, but resistance makes that flow smaller. So that's what Ohm's law is. Um, it states that relationship. And this is, again, um, discovered by George Ohm, who had the name, uh, had it named after him. So, for example, let's say um, I set up a circuit, and that circuit has a measured current of 2 amperes, and it has a resistance of 5 ohms. Given that information, I could solve for what the voltage of the circuit is. So I could say the voltage is going to be equal to the current times the resistance. That voltage would be 2 amperes times 5 ohms, which is 10 units would be volts. So that's a 10 volt system. Um, in another example, let's say I hook a nine volt battery up to a device and that device um, experiences four amperes of current. What was the resistance inside that device? So I would start with my V equals IR solving for resistance that would be resistance is voltage divided by current and then i could say r equals the voltage nine volts divided by the current four amps which would be 2.25 and the units would be ohms so i could say ah that device has 2.25 ohms of resistance in it right um, this is probably the most apt uh, use or productive use in everyday life is to find the current flowing through something. So let's say I have a 140 volt outlet and I plug in a light bulb into that outlet and my light bulb has two ohms of resistance. Okay, so if I do this, what would the current be? Well, that current would be equal to voltage divided by resistance. And so that would be 140 volts divided by 2 ohms, which would be 70, and the units would be amperes. Now, remember, if we go back, um, you can recall that, let's go back here, 0.07 amps is seriously dangerous for people. 0 0.07 amps is dangerous for people. So why do I care about something like um, this Ohm's law? Well, because I can see in this example problem that my resulting current would be 70 amperes. 70. Not 0 0.07 is dangerous. This is, what, 10,000 times bigger than that. So this is a horrifically dangerous thing to do, right? And instead of trying it, right, playing guess and check and saying, oh my God, this electrocuted the hell out of somebody and they died, I could say, hmm, generally speaking, I can tell in advance that this is a really, really bad idea to try. Um, so this obviously makes a difference when you're building circuits for say a house or something like that. You know you're gonna get a constant voltage input and you need to design your circuit to have enough resistance in it in order to be safe, right? So instead of just taking one tiny light bulb, like maybe this is a tiny, tiny light bulb, if I plug that light bulb right into the outlet, it's almost certainly going to explode, um, causing a really dangerous situation. But if I take that tiny light bulb and add an additional, say, uh, thousand, let's say 10,000, ohms of resistors, right? Now, my resistance in my problem is actually going to be, instead of 140, it's going to be 10,002. Okay. Now that sounds more reasonable because that would give me a current of 0 0.014 amperes approximately. 
And uh, 0.014 amperes is still a lot, but it's not deadly a lot, right? So if my whole goal was to just have one tiny light bulb that lit up when I plugged it into the wall, in order to make it safe, I would have to add all this extra resistance um, in order to keep my current at a reasonable level. And that's where Ohm's Law becomes helpful, right? Because it allows you to proactively and preemptively design circuits that are safe and effective, as opposed to having to try plugging things in and seeing if they explode or not, or electrocute you or not. And that's the end. If you have any additional questions, feel free to join our Zoom tomorrow, which is Tuesday. And uh, tomorrow, Zoom will start at 11 a.m. based on the new schedule. Yay! Miss you guys. Have a great day.